I was a frustrated drummer at one time, 
They usually say frustrated drummers become bass players. That's what I've heard. But beloved, I fell in love with the saxophone. And uh, that's where I landed. And uh, songwriting, um, saxophone playing, um, that's, that's what I am. Hello, everybody. God bless you. Grace and peace to you. I know you're not interested in <laughs> hearing about all of that. But I am Bishop J. Charles Carrington Jr. I'm the senior pastor of the Life Builders Church. And welcome to this edition of Midday Matter. Beloved, I must always tell you that Midday Manor is a broadcast ministry of the Life Builders Church, Baltimore. And we are certainly grateful to God for every one of you joining us today, joining us later on to YouTube, joining us on Facebook Live. I am so thankful that you're with us today. I mean, you can be doing a whole lot of things. It's a nice day outside. Um, you know, when I get the chance, I'm going to chase that white ball. Um, you know, I love golfing. It's very relaxing. And I haven't been able to golf because the schedule has been so busy, and that's not good. I know. I hear you. My brother Vaughn, it's not good. I promise you I will do better, and uh, I'm going to do better. But I know that it's been a busy season. I want to say thank you to everybody, and I haven't had a chance to talk much about our BAP project, our building uh, project that is allowing us to believe God together and it's allowing us to be in a place of just doing the work of the Lord, achieving something great, and then, uh, you know, praying and seeking the face of God as to his perfect will. And, um, you know, it's just been a blessing to see how many stood up to help Life Build the Church. And some I didn't even ask. Uh, some gave a lot, some gave a little, but all gave that gave, and I'm thankful. I said thank you on my major Facebook page, on our church Facebook page as well. I actually named names, called people, didn't say how much they gave. It's no one's business but them and God. And um, I just thank God. I've given, helped a lot of people. I don't broadcast it. Um, I'm very selective in who I help because quite simply, you know, resources being what they are, you want to sow into very good ground. What I don't want to sow into is sowing into a game that because I give to you, you give to me. No, that's, that's no reward at all. Um, in fact, Jesus said in one of his occasions of speaking on this subject, if you help those that help you, what, what, what prize have you? You know, so um, I'm so thankful to say that many of my AIM family uh, stood with us during that BAP season. I do want to announce that it is still ongoing. Um, the building front efforts have not ceased. Um, and I do want to say that for right now. I will give a further update at another time. But as many of you also know, we just came through the production of Redemption's Last Call, the reboot. And Redemption's Last Call is based on a book that I wrote um, after the pandemic time, after they uh, buried Freddie Gray. There was a season of uh, uh, turmoil in Baltimore from that time of Freddie Gray's death. Um, by those suspicious circumstances. Um, and then uh, Baltimore was about to be burned. It was horrible. The epicenter once again became the North Avenue area between Fulton and Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, almost the same exact area that, um, unfortunately, some ways is still unrepaired from the 1968 uh, uprising behind the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It's just been a blessing to work this hard on this production. My wife and son, Evan, stepped in, worked as hard as I did, in some cases even harder. And I don't want to ever do anything to disappoint my wife or my son. And uh, they just joined with me. And there were several sponsors, businesses, and pastors who stood with us also. Some gave a little, some gave a lot. But they gave to help support the work of Redemption's Last Call. Now, again, I'm someone, I don't know if they meant any harm or not, I'm not gonna harbor on this, but someone had alluded to the fact if we use building fund, that project money for Redemption's Last Call, um, and that's an emphatic no, that is unethical, that is even unlawful. Whenever you have a building fund, you have to set that money aside, and it cannot be touched for any reason but for building fund and uh, or the use of the church when a statement is made that all funds coming into the ministry are used for the keeping and the upkeep of the ministry. 
But in the case of the building fund, although that is still the case, um, we do set that in a designated account um, and don't touch it. And uh, don't touch it for anything but for building fund purposes. And I'm telling you, God made a blessing come to us. There's still some expenses we want to pay for Redemption's Last Call to Reboot. So if the Lord lays on your heart to seed into that, you can seed into uh, Bishop J. Charles uh, on Cash App. Bishop J. Charles on Cash App. I also have a Zelle uh, and a Venmo account if you want to see into Redemption's Last Call to Reboot. Um, get in touch with me. We receive your seed. It will go towards uh, paying all expenses for Redemption's Last Call that we have remaining. And I'm not begging for money. I'm just letting you know that at no time will anything that is given to me be used unethically. Um, I don't hold in any contempt the person that asked me that. Um, they felt that I was um, approachable enough to ask. And I don't hold them in contempt at all. But it's a shame sometimes. And I'm not talking about this person, but it's a shame how some people will think the worst, see what you're trying to do, don't help you, don't want to do anything to aid you, talk about you. Some people hope it fails. Some people hope it doesn't succeed. I want to report victory. I want to report that the Lord was glorified. I want to report that the uh, city of Baltimore is under deep prayer, deep intercession. Efforts are going forth every day to rescue our city from the violence, from the demonic strongholds that are trying to tear it down and destroy it. I have to say something, and this is not a spike to anybody, nor is this shade being thrown. But Baltimore is not progressing in the way it should as a major city. In fact, we are regressing. I'm not saying it's anyone's fault. But what business would want to move here with 19 shootings in the weekend? What businesses would want to take residence in our city when the hiring pool is very badly educated? This is not throwing rocks. This is just saying, Baltimore, we want better. we got to do better to get better. I'm going to say it again. We want better. we got to do better to get better. And I think that power is in our hands. I'm passionate about seeing our city progress. I'm thankful for what's going on from the Sagamore group down there um, in Baltimore, downtown, um, right there. Uh, they're doing a wonderful work near the Baltimore Sun Building. They're the, the people are, uh, that are going that, not gonna call their names, but they're doing a wonderful thing down there, building up that area. Um, there are many great businesses in our area, some of which help sponsor Redemption's last call because they caught hold to the vision and they want very much to see Baltimore progress. Some of you that are on Facebook Live of my personal page, you can look at those who sold into both our BAP project, our Redemption's Last Call initiative, pastors, some pastors gave uh, to buy 10 tickets uh, for the at-risk youth. And we invited from the probation and parole department, people that are in that system and clients to come because this is where the recidivism is often few, often few. Uh, many young men that have been shot, some have died, uh, were found with ankle bracelets on. This is something that has to be dealt with, and you got to deal with it one heart at a time, one life at a time. But there's definitely redemption, and we got to care. You cannot not care. If you don't live in Baltimore, if you're from some other urban center or where violence is increasing, Savannah, Georgia, always going strong in Chicago, other places even increasing more in New York and it has, and people are trying to find answers. Listen, everybody wants to live. Everybody wants to live safely. There are those who are selfish and don't respect life and want to kill instead of dealing with their issues another way. I want to remind you of what Jesus said. He that uses the sword, and I'm speaking today's language, will die by the sword. You're not made of Teflon. Bullets pierce your skin as well. And you out here killing indiscriminately, shooting, walking up on people, putting a gun in their head, on their head, and pulling the trigger and think you won't die too. 
You get killed by the sword, you shall also die by the sword. And your life is limited when you live that, that way. That's why I'm on here talking about the kingdom of God. That's why I'm on here talking about the parables of Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to throw shade, but it's time that we see that the power to fix Baltimore and everything wrong about Baltimore is in Baltimore. And we must get to work. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for what you've allowed us to do over this past month. The month of June has been very busy between the BAP initiative and Redemption's last call. Lord God, I thank you that you were glorified. You're still being glorified. And I ask you right now by your spirit to speak through this, your servant today, to declare your word and to say what thus saith the Lord. Lord, take me out of self. Use me for somebody else. This is my prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, hold up your Bibles and let's declare together. And let's say this because I believe in making declaration to set the stage. Lord, I thank you that I have my Bible. It is my personal copy of basic instruction before leaving earth. I am a believer, not a doubt. I'm not just a hearer, but also a doer. And my life is so much more the blessed because I hear and I obey the word of the living God. I do declare right now that my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will not be distracted, but I will hear what the word of the Lord has to say. And as a result of what I hear today, I will leave this environment better than I came to in Jesus' name. Amen. Quickly turn your Bibles to parable number 16 in our study of the parables of Jesus. Parable number 16 in our study of the parables of Jesus. And let's declare the word of the Lord in your hearing. Also want to look at verses uh, Matthew chapter 21, verse 28 to 32. The parables of Jesus, Matthew's gospel, chapter 21, verse 28 to 32. Now I'll read briskly, but today I want to read from two different versions. I'm going to read from the um, classic Amplified, this text. I'm going to read that after I read the King James. This is a very powerful parable. Is number 16, the parable of the two sons. But what think ye, Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterwards he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, likewise. And the answer says, I go, sir, and went not. Hmm. Whether of them twain did the will of the Father. Wow. They say unto him, the first. Jesus said unto them, verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness and ye believed him not but the publicans and the harlots believed him and ye when ye had seen it repented not afterwards that you might believe him god whoo, have mercy i am at this text in the amplified matthew's gospel chapter 21 let's look at verse 28 to 32 what do you think, Jesus said? There was a certain man who had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterwards he changed his mind, changed his mind and went out. Then the man came to his second son and said the same thing. And he replied, I will go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They replied, the first one, Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the harlots, the publicans, <coughs> excuse me, in today's language, and the hoes, 
<laughs> will get into the kingdom of heaven before you. But John came to you walking in the way of upright man in right standing with God and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the harlots did believe him. And you, even when you saw that, did not afterwards change your minds and believe him and adhere to trust in and rely on what he told you. Parable number 16, the parable of the two sons. Parable number 16, the parable of the two sons. Lord, let me tell you from the outset what my main sight is of this parable. What we do in some cases is greater than what we say. See like that for a moment. Just, just see like that. Ponder it. Think about it. What we do in some cases is greater than what we say. Many believe that they are approved of God by words alone. Lord have mercy, it's going to be a good ride today. Relationship is what makes you repent. I know there are some doctrines. Um, I don't necessarily ascribe to Calvinism, but I know one of the doctrine points in Calvinism, if I could say, is that God has re re forgiven us already of the original sin. Yes, it is true. When Adam sinned, the Bible says when Adam all died, but in Jesus Christ, all are made alive. Very true. However, I think that Calvinism stops short in discussing the relationship area of what we have come to find that is the true cause of why we repent when we sin. God has, let me emphasize, God has already died. He's died. He sent his son, Jesus. Jesus is God. That's why I said God has died. Jesus died for all of our sin. Sin of our past, the sin of our present, and the sin of our future. He's eradicated the power of sin over us. But there are two things that we must consider. First of all, what you don't believe will not have full benefit to your life. What you don't practice will not become a permanent part of your life. Jesus did die for all of us, but all don't believe. So therefore, you're still in your sin and you're still dying in your sin without a change of mind. Again, what you believe will benefit you. What you don't believe will not benefit you. Again, it doesn't make it not true. It just doesn't benefit you. Yes, there are truths that are immutable, unchanged. The majority of times, what goes down is because of gravity. And you do not eradicate the law of gravity. You suspend it. But everything that is dropped from a height there's an equation, force equals mass times acceleration. Things usually move at the speed of 9.8 meters per second squared. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, and the force of that is measured by the weight and the speed is constant. So, so what needs to be understood that there are some things that are unchanged. And as much as we want to make it fit us, there are just some truths that the Lord spoke that um, are not changed. What's not changed? Ezekiel 18 tells us all souls, God says, are mine. All souls are mine. That will never change. The Bible says further that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, what made that to be changed or changeable is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, 
to add everlasting life. Now, that's immutable. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's what the Bible says. Okay? But, though it is true that Jesus died for my sins completely, past sins, present sins, future sins, because I have a relationship with him, I have to take it seriously and not want to offend him. Some say you can't let God down because you're not holding them up. Well, because I'm in relationship, I can disappoint him. Because I'm in relationship, I can transgress his word and he will not be happy about it. He will just pat us on the head and say, good job, Johnny. You went out here and you just killed 15 people in the school. Uh, he still loves us. That, that is immutable. The love of God is one of those immutable factors that will never change. But at the same time, the love of God must be lived out through us to love people. You can't tell me you love people you're going to shoot people. 15 at a time in a school, children and uh, adults. You're not going to mass murder um, if you love God. You're not going to hate somebody because their skin is not the same color as yours if you love God. You're not going to just preach about abortion and not take care of the children outside of the womb if you love God. We have our pet peeves, and I surely believe in life. Make no mistake about it. And I surely am pro-life because God is pro-life. God said, I set before you this day life and death, blessing and cursing. Then he gives us and prompting and urging, choose life that you and your seed may live. So I am pro-life. I've chosen life. Thank God that regarding abortion, my mom chose life. She was a young teenage young woman when she had me. Her and my dad got married. I came along two years later. My mother was still a teenager when I was born. So my father was right at the age of 20 when I was born. So they got married legally. They, they got married because back when they got married in the, in the, in the early 60s, because I was born in the early 60s, um, you can get married at a certain age with your parents' permission. So, you know, my mom chose life. And if you're watching me today, so did yours. So I'm not going to argue about abortion. I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to damn those who have had abortions, those who are having them. I'm not going to do that. Because the relationship tells me that God loves the abortionist and the abortion. And um, he will judge. But his main desire is that he draw you to him. And for those that may have had an abortion and guilt and shame, it's hovering over your head. I want to tell you, Jesus loves you. What does that got to do with this parable? Well, I started off saying it's about relationship. The oldest son was asked, I believe he was the oldest. He was asked by his dad, go work in the vineyard. And um, he flatly refused. I don't know why. I don't know if he had an attitude. I don't know if he was tired that day. The Bible doesn't give detail about his status. All it says is that when the father asked him to go to the vineyard, the son refused. He said, I will not, flat out. There doesn't appear to be an argument. The father doesn't appear to whoop him, <laughs> to, to uh, take away his PlayStation. Uh, the father simply moved on. Then he saw the other son. And he asked the other son to go into the vineyard. And he said, I will. But he didn't go. Going back to the other son, the first son, he was asked and flatly refused, but he repented. I think somewhere along the line, that relationship word has been overshadowed by sometimes faulty teachings on grace. Please don't turn me off. Grace is not permission to sin with the get out of jail free card waiting. Grace is not God's divine allowance of us indulging in flesh and thinking he just going to bypass it. 
I'm married. I've been married for 38 years, going on 39. Happy years. Blessed years. I love my wife more every day. If and when I've ever done something that offends her, it hurts me because we have a relationship. I, I bleed. I've, I've done some things that have made her cry, you know, over the course of our marriage. I'm not proud of it. And now let me get myself together because I love her. Never want to hurt my wife. Never want to disappoint her by anything I say or do. I love her that much. So if I hurt her, I want to quickly repent. That don't mean just apologize for one time and then go back and do it again. That, that's not repentance. Repentance is the act of changing your mind from one state of being to the better state of being. Let's make sure we understand that definition. Repentance is the act of changing your mind from a lesser state of being to a greater state of being. Repentance is a process. It, it just, you know, may take place by you actually being sorry for what you did, which is great. But when you truly repent, it's a process because you want to work away from, walk away from what you did to hurt the one you love because you love them. Relationship is involved. I cannot go around here consistently offending my wife if I really love her. Vice versa. If I really love God, can I truly say that it's okay for me to continue to transgress his word and think nothing of it and act like it just don't matter? See, the parables are the teachings of Jesus telling stories of what the kingdom, his way of doing things, is all about. May I say that in the kingdom of God, in God's way of doing things, repentance is very much relevant. Repentance, again, change your mind from a lower state of being to a higher state of being, higher state of understanding. So when the word repent is mentioned, it is not damning, it is not condemning, it is not throwing rocks. It is a call to move up. It is a call, hear me, to upgrade. It is a call to go from a lower state of understanding to a higher state of understanding. So let's go back to this young man again. He was asked by his father. Go into the vineyard. You do something for me. Work in the vineyard. Work in the vineyard. He said no. But something took place to make him change from a lower state of being to a higher state. Why do you say lower? I mean, he has a right to say no. Sure he does. But because of relationship, his father obviously asked him to work in the vineyard because he had a need for him to work in the vineyard. Let's don't get that twisted. Let's take for granted that the father was of good means, okay, and maybe had servants. But maybe the father's reason for wanting his son to work in the vineyard was to watch and see that the servants do what they're supposed to do. Maybe the father was coming up short in the tally of the produce produce of the vineyard. Maybe. He wanted the son to be there to intimidate the workers so they will work right and work well. I don't know. But what I do know is that after he refused, something happened to make him turn and undo what he refused. Don't know what that is, but I do know that when you have relationships, you don't want to be at a place of offense. Now, parents, you know it's true. Your children, you may give them a, a task to do, and you ask them to take care of it, and they say no, and you get offended. <laughs> my mother tell me make up my bed, clean my room. I ain't telling Betty no. <laughs> my father say, son, I'm going to work today. I want the grass cut by the time I get back home. 
And I said, oh man, get out of my face. First of all, after I wake up a week later, um, he'll sit down and explain to me <laughs> oh, that I don't talk to him like that. You know, relationship has boundaries, it has expectations. One of those boundaries and expectations is honor. When the father asks the child, the son, to do something, honor makes you go do it. So let's just add that the son saw that he dishonored his father and turned and began to do what he told him to do. God gets glory, obviously, from this text. When Jesus made the comparison of the publicans and uh, harlots to, to be better, actually, than the scribes and the Pharisees, because he came to them, and the Bible even says that, he came to his own, and his own has received him not, in John 1. But to as many as received him, to them gave me power to become the sons of God, even to those that call upon his name. You know, can I say this? And you know I am. Uh, hmm. Our religion has sometimes put false obligations, false expectations, false actions in our face. And, and we have thrown that to God. You know, I'm going to serve you on Sunday. And there's people out here trying to fuss about what's the Sabbath. The Sabbath is Saturday. But the word of God did not say worship only on Saturday. There's no way you can show me that. In fact, the word of God teaches that Jesus rose the first day of the week, which is Sunday. If we follow the calendar. The Bible says the command of God, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, sacrosanct, set aside. But as I study this text out, and, and, and I don't want to offend anybody, it doesn't say Saturday is the only day to worship. It said, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So, sounds like to me that when I read the Bible and see the command of God say, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, I'm going to do that, but I'm also going to gather, as the old the New Testament church saints did, the apostles did, on the first day of the week in many occasions. The Bible says that on the first day of the week, they were all together on the first day of the week, blah, 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 blah. I would like to believe that the first day of the week, Sunday, is a good day to worship too. Because it is actually a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. I mean, that's the honest truth. The Bible is clear. He rose the third day. The third day happened to be the first day of the week. He was crucified, and for three days and three nights, he was in the belly of the earth. Just like Jonah was in the belly of the great fish. So there's some things I'm going to talk about later, even about some of our beliefs on when he rose, uh, actually when he died, but that's not the day, not today's topic. But we must understand that this argument and even these gentlemen that wear these purple t-shirts um, and some of the um, uh, Hebrew Israelites and others that want to argue using scripture out of context. You know, the Bible says very plainly, avoid vain, vain battlings and arguments. You know, there's nothing to argue about. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Truth. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. <laughs> we do that. At least I do. My wife does. Um, and we worship on Saturdays. Yes, we worship. We reflect. We take time out to prepare our hearts to hear from God. And that's what we do. We keep the Sabbath holy. I don't stay out all night on Saturdays. I come home if I'm out early. And then you even know we know that. I got a nine o'clock curfew. I'm in the house. If I'm out, I'm in the house unless it's an emergency by nine o'clock on Saturdays. And Sundays to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus, which is in the Bible. The first day of the week, I gather with other saints in corporate worship. 
There are some Saturdays I gather with other saints in corporate worship. I guess what I'm trying to do is say that when you have relationship, the nonsensical doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to argue and to dishonor. The son realized that, got up from his no and went and worked in the vineyard. He saw the error of his ways. He saw that his no displeased his father. But here in this text, as I prepare to close, the other son said yes at you and didn't go at all. Now, oh, Jesus asked the question, which son did the will of his father? And rightly so, those who were listening answered, the first son. How many of us have put our mouth out to say, I will go all the way with God? Oh, come on, don't turn me off. How many of us have said, I will follow him the days of my life? How many of us have declared he's the best thing that ever happened to me? And how many of us have declared, Lord, I love you with all my heart, only when the often challenges to my flesh arise, then I quickly go back on my promise to follow him. Lord, I'm not trying to hurt anybody, but come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Let's understand, sometimes our mouth says things that our heart doesn't mean. Sometimes we say things out of religious obligation instead of out of heart relationship. Again, I challenge religion because religion is not what God called us to have. He called us to have relationship. In fact, <clears throat> Jesus cleared it up what religion really is. Feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the widow in her time, helping the widow, you know, these things are really what religion is. But relationship is a heart thing. And many of the whores and prostitutes and, 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 and publicans were pricked in their heart to repent because they were given relationships. I don't want to speak out of turn. I don't know all that were in the upper room. But I want to believe that that woman who was caught in adultery was in the upper room. I want to believe that the Mary that kissed Jesus' feet, washed him with her tears, dried them with their hair, and they poured on the expensive ointment, who Jesus said to he who is much is forgiven, um, they have greater honor. They have greater love. I believe she may have been in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. I, I believe Ron Bartimaeus was in that room. You know, there's a parable that Jesus spoke about. I'm not going to get into it, so I won't confuse this, but he had 153 separate accounts with people that are spoken of in the Gospels. And just before he went back to heaven and the disciples went back fishing and he encountered them in John, I believe chapter 20, chapter 21, um, Jesus told them to go back, ask them had they had any food. He said, no. He said, cash your net on the right side of the boat. The first time he said that, the net broke. The second time it brought in a catch of 153 fish. I believe that when we repent and we keep our word with God and we have relationship in proper context as first place in our lives, that the net don't break. The net broke the first time one of the reasons was to reveal their capacity. They did not yet have the capacity to hold the catch. But in the second time that that didn't break, it was a revelation that their capacity had increased to hold the catch. Beloved, that second son really shows us the status of many of our hearts. 
We let other things make us not keep our word. We make other things draw us from our devotion. So I believe, like I said earlier, many believe that they are approved of God by words alone. And that is not the case. That's why the scripture that I love so dearly says, let the words of my mouth, let the meditation of my heart, Lord, be acceptable in your sight. Indeed, you are my strength. And you indeed are my redeemer. Beloved, as I close, do what you do and let what you do speak louder than what you say. There are some that have told God, no, I'm not going to work for you. But they changed their heart, changed their mind. And they're serving him now. Then there are those who are zealous to serve God and zealous to run after God. But then when it comes to time to do it, you can't be found. Beloved, what I say is that from this parable, you must understand. Let your words be fewer than your actions. Let your actions validate your words. The kingdom of God is such a way that when you change your mind and see your status, you go from what is lesser to that which is greater. For right now, here endeth the lesson. I pray that you got some out of this. I pray that it touched your life. I pray that it brought change to your heart because that's the goal. Change my heart, Lord. Let me not talk a good game. Let me do your work, do your will, follow your ways and honor you. Not just what I say, but how I live. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Indeed, you are my strength and my redeemer. Here is the parable of the two sons. Which one will you be? Father, I pray for those that are listening to me today. I pray that if they are separated from you, outside of your will, living a raucous, ratchet, <laughs> raunchy life, Lord, living a hypocritical life, living a life outside of your will, plan, and agenda, that they will see the error of their ways. Turn from that which is less to that which is greater and be who you've called them to be. Lord, I ask you to do this for your glory, for your name is above every name, and you are awesome as our God. But Lord, let the words of life bring change of heart. Today I look into this camera and I speak to you if you do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. Let me introduce him to you because I know him. He's the best thing that ever happened to me. Oh yeah, I'm thoroughly in love with my wife, but she would tell you the same as I just told you. He's the best thing that ever happened to me. Talking about Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, don't believe the lies that he's simply a good prophet, a good man. Uh, he hasn't come yet. He's not the Messiah. As a Jew, Jesus was very much man and very much God. And he is and was and will always be the son of God, the great I am, the Messiah. My Jewish brothers and sisters, you don't have to look for him anymore to come later. He's come and he's here for you. My Muslim brothers and sisters, my sheep or Sikh brothers and sisters, my uh, Buddhist brothers and sisters, my my uh, Hare Krishna brothers and sisters, all other other religions. Let me speak to you and say the Messiah has come. His name is Jesus. He died for you whether you don't believe him or not. I call to you. Come unto him all ye that labor and the heavy laden. Leave religion and find him in relationship. Love you dearly. If you need to call us, do so at 443-776-0255. Do it now. Someone's waiting to talk to you. If the line is not available, we will call you back. Leave a message. Also, we are at email at lbcministry 
at yahoo.com. That's our email, LBC Ministry at yahoo.com. Then you can reach us through our website. That's lbcbaltimore.org. www.lbcbaltimore.org. You can contact us, contact us through those three ways. Website, LBC Baltimore www.lbcbaltimore.org You can contact us through our email lbc at lbc ministry lbc ministry at yahoo.com Then there's the phone number 443-776-0255 Love, we gotta go. I, I, I can't stay on here all day. I would love to. I love teaching, I love preaching, I love ministering the word of God, rightly divided, okay? Some may want to ask me about some things I said. I'd be love, really glad to talk with you, but I'm not going to argue. I found that um, vain babblings and arguments lead to nothing but contention, especially when you see how right I am. <laughs> Beloved, I love you dearly. Thank you again to all that have contributed to our BAT project. I do Again, Declare is continuing. If you want to contribute, you can go to paypal.me, Life Builders Ministry, uh, backslash Life Builders Ministry, and give through that or through Cash App, Life Builders Church, dollar sign Life Builders Church. Uh, BAP is still going on, and we'll have some updates for you in a little bit. Also, those that came to Redemption's last call, tell people about it. We've been asked to do it again. We'll announce that at another time. Um, we want to be a blessing. Also, it may go on the road. Uh, there's some other things in the works for Redemption's Last Call. I can't talk about right now, but I do tell you, God is doing a great thing. You want to sow into that. You want to sow into the recent um, production we just finished. Um, so all debts, all bills can be canceled and paid off. You know, I'm not saying we're in debt. I'm just saying if you want to sue, we so into it. I welcome it at dollar sign Bishop J. Charles. That's Cash App. That's uh, also you can access my uh, Zelle by my phone number. Many of you that know me know my phone number. Or if you don't know my phone number, you can go by my name on Zelle and uh, be a blessing. Venmo as well. I do not want you to think that we are mixing monies, but each project will get what you donate earmarked for. We love you. We appreciate you. Man, I love this smooth jazz coming from Anaheim, California, Victory Outreach Ministries. Let's go out with this great song and enjoy it. God bless. <laughs>
Thank you. 